Tis the season to be jolly. It's beginning to look and feel a lot like Christmas. You ought to be giving a standing ovation for the gifted young people of new birth. They always blow me away by their enthusiasm, their zeal, their charisma, and their depth. I want you to put hearts on the screen right now. If you love our kids, you support them, and you are so godly. We're young, gifted, and black. We're gifted because we understand without a church with young people, there is no future. I want us to emulate the wise men. I've been talking about them for the last two weeks. They took two years to get to where Jesus was. How long is it going to take you to invite somebody to this praise party? To invite somebody to worship with us. As a matter of fact, you ought to do your own watch party right now with friends, family, and foes because all of them need the gift of Jesus in this season. The amazing thing about the wise men that I marvel is none of them had tenure professorship at any university. There are no books with their name on it. What made them wise is when they came into the presence of our God, they brought a gift. I want you to be a wise man. I want you to be a wise woman. I want you to be a wise worshiper. Before we ever get to Christmas, I want you to get your gift in your possession. Grab your phone, and right below me, you'll find the prompts by which you can give gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Our tithers know you are 24 karat givers because if when you give the best of your service, your co-workers got a gift, cousins you don't speak to, children that don't appreciate it, but I'm telling you, God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. I'm challenging you right now. I D-double dog dare you to give your best gift unto God, realizing it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. What must I render unto God for all of these blessings? God made everything and everything belongs to him. You better be careful. He's checking his list and he's checking it twice. He's trying to see who's a tither, who's a sower, and who's a giver because he only gives seed to the sower. I want you to sow your seed right now. Give your tithe. Give your Christmas gift unto God. I'm telling you, I'm the selfish type. And because I'm the selfish type, I decided, like many of you, I'm going to get myself something for Christmas. And do you know what I got? I got a friend to come in on this day. I am so thankful for the amazingly anointed, intelligent, and articulate brother of mine, Darius Daniels. He has never been to new birth before in his life, but I guarantee that after you hear this, you're going to want him to come back again and again. He is one of the most sought-after communicators of the gospel, and I marvel every time I hear him open up the bread and the book of life. And here's where it is that you ought to be excited. I want to share my gift with you. Right after our music ministry would have uh, completed, I want you to warmly welcome my friend, my brother, our preacher for this moment, God's gift in this season, Dr. Darius Daniels. Give glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. We give glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb. Everybody say. you worship with us and say it to the Lamb of God. Come on. In your home, why don't you worship and say it to the Lamb. That's it. That's right. Use your voice and say it. That's it. To the Lamb. 
for he is Alpha. Come on, for he is Alpha. Hey, Omega, say it. Everybody, let's worship him. He reigns, he rules. And we join the angels and we say, Holy is he. Would you join us and say, Glory to the Lamb? That's it. Come on, let's worship Jesus today.
Yes, right in your homes. So, Father, we love you this morning, thanking you that over 2,020 years ago, you did come. And not only did you come, you're coming right now in our homes, in our living rooms, in our cars, meeting people right where they are. I pray that as we gather in worship, that you would demonstrate your glory, that you would manifest your might, and that you would speak to your people. May the specificity of this word be a revelation of your love. May your people know they are seen, they are known, and your finger is on the pulse of what's going on in their life. Thank you for this house. Thank you for our houses. We ask this in the name of the one who saved our life. That name is Jesus. And if you love him, I want you to drop amen right in the chat, right there, right where you are. <laughs> Well, listen, family, I want to pause for the calls and uh, celebrate, first of all, the goodness of our God. He's consistently consistent, reliably reliable, and we celebrate him today, his, his faithfulness in coming to us in a form that we needed over 2,020 years ago. Celebrate this amazing house, this spiritual weapon of mass destruction this, this light that pushes back darkness, this expression, really, this complete and comprehensive expression of what it means to be a New Testament ministry, to save souls, but also feed the hungry. And we, ce we celebrate the work that God is doing in and through this church, and we celebrate and recognize the leader that he is set to help facilitate all that is happening in this season, the inimitable Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. <laughs> uh, and um, like I know when pastors preach, they're supposed to make the obligatory um, um, complimentary remarks, but uh, I think I say this each and every time I get an opportunity. Um, Pastor, I just celebrate you, brother, for your selflessness and how you are willing to use your influence to be a voice for the voiceless and how you're willing to share the influence that God has given you with others like myself. Um, years ago, I can't, probably 10 years ago, Seven last words, service that you were doing live on the Word Network, and you had me come, and I sat down next to you after I finished speaking. You said, Darius, you a prayer answered. I say, why? You say, you know, I never heard you preach. God just told me to have you come. And so thank you for the man that you are. And one more time, all in this house, all in your houses, come on, let's celebrate the, the leadership of Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant. Well, listen, family, it's the last Sunday in Advent, and as we prepare second to last Sunday in 2020, I'm ready for this year to be over. Uh, <laughs> but there's something on my heart I kind of want to share with you in, in celebration of the last Sunday in Advent, but also in anticipation of 2021. I want to read one verse of Scripture from the good news about Jesus from Matthew's perspective. Matthew chapter number 14, verse number 28, uh, reads like this. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. 
Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. In celebration of the last Sunday in Advent, in anticipation of us going into 2021, I want to tag a title to this text. I want to talk from this subject in our time together. It's your affirmation and your declaration. I'm out of here. <laughs> Put that in the chat right now if you're feeling that already. I'm out of here. Family, as we celebrate uh, this last Sunday in Advent, I'd like to begin our time together by articulating that Advent is an indication that God is intentional. The birth, the coming, the advent of Jesus was not random. It was not coincidental. It was not haphazard, nor did it happen by happenstance. It was strategic. It was planned. It was meticulous. It was orchestrated intentionally by God. Hundreds of years before his birth, a prophet named Isaiah prophesied that a virgin would conceive. His name would be called Wonderful and Counselor. Hundreds of years before his birth, a prophet named Micah prophesied that out of Bethlehem, would come the Messiah that was charged, commissioned, and created to save the world from their sins. Advent is an indication, listen to me, that God is intentional. He does not operate flippantly or randomly. He is intentional, deliberate, and strategic. Therefore, his actions are never an end unto themselves. They are always a means to an end. That whenever he's doing something you can see, it's because he's doing something else to hit you can't see. Because he's intentional. So when he's doing something, he's doing something intentionally because he's intentional. But when he's doing nothing, he's doing nothing intentionally because he's intentional. So when he's doing something, he's doing something. I need to praise him for that. But when he's doing nothing, he's doing something. And I need to praise him for that. And I know everybody in this season is celebrating all that God is doing, uh, God intervening in the affairs of their life. But I want to know, is there anybody watching this morning that's bold enough to say, I'm going to pause and put a praise on the fact, not that he's doing something. I'm going to praise him even when he's doing nothing, because I know when he's doing nothing, he's doing nothing intentionally. So he's doing something. God yeah, is in, intentional. And this Advent season is an indication of the intentionality of God. It's a revelation of his resilience. It's a picture of his persistence, of his willingness, even if it takes him hundreds of years, to keep his word, to watch over his word to perform it, of his commitment to keep his word to the degree that even when individuals like hating Herod attempt to assassinate the promise of God, God will intervene in the affairs of human history because when he has spoken a word over your life, if he's got a part of Red Sea, make a Jericho wall fall, make old women get pregnant, he'll do whatever he's got to do to bring that word to pass in your life because God is intentional. Yeah. And one of the truths he seems to be intentional about communicating to you and I is this gift, watch this, that he gave us not just in Christ, look at me, but through Christ. 
See, in this Advent season, individuals are appreciating the gift of Christ. But God seems to be intentional about communicating a gift that he gives us through Christ. Watch this. And that is, y'all better come get me, a life of exceptionalism. <laughs> Pastor, what, what, what is that? What? See, an exception is an anomaly. <laughs> it's a deviation. It's an irregularity. It's a special case. It's a rule breaker. <laughs> and the virgin birth is an indication of God's ability to make exceptions, of God's commitment to break rules. I call it the principle of exception. Here it is. What happens with them does not dictate and determine what happens with me. I'm going to say it again. What happens with them does not dictate and determine what happens with me. In other words, previous patterns are not accurate indicators of future possibilities. That you can't look at what happened with other people and then draw a conclusion about what God wants to do with me. Because God reveals intentionally through scripture that his people are to be people who live lives where they are the exception. See, this is not a declaration of superiority. It's a declaration of distinction. We're not saying we better than. We saying we different from. And I want to know is there <laughs> is there anybody here that recognizes, understands and embraces your different? If you walking in your difference for the rest of 2020 and walking into your difference in 2021, I want you to drop it in the chat. I'm different. That's why people make judgments about me without knowing me. It's because I'm different. Uh, this is why I'm allergic to average and mediocrity because I am different. You, you see, here it is. The, the distinction is not always in the experience. Believers go through some of the same things that other believers, that, that non-believers go through. The distinction in the, it isn't always in the experience. Gospel's not a gospel of avoidance. The, the, the distinction is not always in the experience. The distinction is in the outcome. We go through what other people go through. <laughs> but we don't come out the way other people come out. See, we're not denying norms, but we're making a declaration that my life does not have to be limited by them, governed by them, imprisoned by them, and defined by them. There are always exceptions. Why can't I be one of them? Because what happens with others does not dictate and determine what can happen with me. Yes, indeed. Women in their 90s don't have babies. But with God, <laughs> Sarah experienced an exception. People don't go in lion's dens and come out all put together. But with Daniel, God made an exception. People don't go in fiery furnaces and come out and don't even smell like smoke. See, some people come out, but they smell like it. Their attitude smells like it. Their heart emits an odor that says you've been wounded and burned and betrayed. But they came out and didn't even smell like it. Because with the Hebrew boys, God made an exception. Don't miss this. Red seas don't part. But with Moses, God made an exception. Walls don't fall just from people screaming and shouting. But with Joshua at Jericho, God made an exception. Come get me. Dead men don't go in the grave. Stay there three days and then get up early Sunday morning. But with Jesus, God made an 
exception. And I came to tell somebody he's getting ready to make one with you. <laughs> yeah, they didn't recover, but you getting ready to recover. They didn't get the opportunity, but you getting ready to get it. They didn't bounce back, but you getting ready to bounce back. They didn't come through, but you getting ready to come through because God is the God of exception. And I want somebody who believes this before you come out of 2020 uh, to expect exceptionalism. Hey, glory to God. Not because I've been good to God. Exceptionalism is not a revelation of our goodness. Exceptionalism is a revelation of God's goodness. He says, I'm going to do this not because you've been good to me. I'm going to do this because I made a decision to be good to you. He's the God of exceptions. And there's a word that is often used to describe people who understand, watch this, and embrace this truth. There's, there's a word that can be used to describe those that understand and embrace this truth. The word is water walker. Ah, it's, 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 it's water walker. See, John Ortberg notes that, that the Bible is inundated with examples of walkers. God walked in the garden anthropomorphically in the cool of the day. Enoch walked with God. Abraham walked to Mount Moriah. Moses walked on ground through the Red Sea. Joshua walked around the walls of Jericho. The, disi the disciples walked on Emmaus Road. Jesus walked the Via Della Rosa, but none of the walking that I just mentioned compares to the walker we see in this text. In this text, we see somebody walking on what other people drown in. Hey, they drowned in it. You getting ready to walk on it. Yeah, we, we, we see in the text Somebody walking, don't miss this, on water. Yeah, yeah if, 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 we, if we were to deeply explore the disciples' experience here, you'll see I picked up the story in verse 28, but contextually, you'll probably need to Jake walk back to verse 22 where the Bible says, and Jesus sent the disciples ahead of him. <laughs> and he didn't go with them. So they obey the instruction of their rabbi. Get in a boat. And he, watch this, is not with them. Have you ever felt? that your obedience led to isolation. You're like, now, God, I was fine on this shore. Huh? I was minding my business on this shore. You told me <laughs> to get in this boat and to go to the other side. Even if I misinterpreted your instruction, the intentions of my heart were pure. So I would think that if you're telling me to get in this boat, you would at least get in here with me. I don't want to be in here in the first place. But I at least would think you would get in here with me. 
it's metaphorically an indication how God uses, watch this, how God uses the perception of his absence to facilitate the pursuit of his presence. He says, if you feel like I'm always with you, you won't chase me. So whenever I need you to intentionally attempt to access a greater degree of intimacy with me, what I do is I give you this experience where you perceive, you assume that there's divine absence because I don't let you feel me the way you used to feel me. But I use that absence as a motivator to get you to pursue me in a way that you would not pursue me if you felt me the way you used to feel me. He, they get in the boat and he don't get in there with them. He said, go to the other side. Watch this. And the only way they're going to run into him is if they meet him at the point of their obedience. Y'all miss it. you like, God, where are you? He, he like, I'm where I sent you. And when you get to where I sent you, you'll meet me again. <laughs> Elijah, go down. <laughs> go down the chair to the brook. I'm going to feed you there. Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. There, I'm going to give you my message. Because I don't meet you on your terms. I meet you on mine. Get in the boat. Go on to the other side. Their obedience not only led to their isolation, their obedience led to some inconvenience. They run into a storm. Now, our assumptions are, God, if I do what you say, storms will never get in my way. They're in the middle of a storm. And the Bible says, don't miss this, Jesus goes off to a solitary place to pray. It says, and not too long before dawn, he walks out to meet them on the shore. Y'all just missed that. I said, y'all just missed that. They had a head start worth of hours. Jesus catches up and meets them in the middle of the sea. For hours, they had been rowing or sailing. Jesus had been praying. They had a head start. I'm coming for you. They had a head start worth of hours. And Jesus didn't panic because he recognized that prayer never cost me time. It saved me time. <laughs> so they had to roll their way there. He walked his way there. They had to strain their way there. He stepped his way there. They had a head start of hours, but he caught up with them. Because this is an indication of God's ability to get you to the place you're supposed to be even though people started out before you. I'm coming for somebody today that feels like you behind schedule, that feels like I should be further along in this season of my life. I'm coming for someone today who feels like I mismanaged previous opportunities and now I've blown those opportunities and I will not be able to arrive at God's intended end for me. Maybe Jesus walking to them in the middle of the sea is to encourage you and me to know that God is a God that'll help you catch up. <laughs> He's a God that redeems your time.
done. He said, listen, I'll do something in the next 10 days, and it'll make up for every door you missed the past 10 years. I'm a God, oh my, I'm a God that will help you make up for lost time. And if there's anybody watching that believes you're getting ready to catch up, I want you to tell your future in the chat, I'm on my way. You started before me, but I'm on my way. Last spring was your spring to say I do, but it's my season coming up real soon. I'm on my way. Watch this. Y'all, I'm almost done. Everybody all right? If you're all right, put them all right in the chat. Here it is. Here it is. He walking, right? And the Bible says, when the disciples saw him, they got afraid and said, it's a ghost. Now, here's my question. Here's my question. How can you walk with me, eat with me, fraternize with me for three years and don't recognize me when I'm walking on the sea? Maybe it's because God doesn't always initially look like God in a storm. I got to go. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> they said, it's a ghost. <laughs> but then when he got closer, Peter said, look, if it's you, bid me to come on the water. See, here it is. They called him a ghost because they labeled a thing prematurely in the middle of a storm. See, somebody is in the middle of a storm right now. <laughs> You need to be careful what you calling it. Because the thing you calling trouble in this season might be the thing you look back and say, that was God in another season. The thing you calling a layoff in this season, you're going to be calling God in the next season. The thing you call rejection in one season, you may be calling God in another. Because God don't always look like God in a storm. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now notice, notice now, notice now. This is, this is so interesting, Pastor. This is, notice, Peter says, I want to come to you. If it's you, tell me to come to you. I'm not a sensationalist. I'm not a mystic. I'm not someone that's so bored with spirituality that I got to slide into some pseudo-spirituality that's unbiblical and unhealthy. He's like, no, I ain't just trying to walk on water because I'm bored. I'm trying to get to you. And Jesus said, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. Here it is. There are sometimes people don't walk on water because come is not enough for you. Y'all missed that? He, he didn't say, come, and I'm going to defy gravity. He didn't say, come, and when you step out of the boat, the water is going to feel like a walkway, and you're going to be able to walk on it. All Jesus said was, come. And there are some people that don't walk on water because your obedience requires detail that God's not going to give. Sometimes the only thing he's going to say is, come, and we'll figure out the rest later. Go, and we'll figure out the rest later. And the question is, is come? Come enough. After, because if you read Matthew chapter 14, you will see that this Jesus' dismissal was of the disciples to get on the boat and go to the other side was just after the miracle he performed with two fish and five loaves of bread. In other words, I should have. 
enough evidence in my history that demonstrates that if I tell you to come, coming is in you. Y'all, did you hear what I just said? If I tell you to build it, building is in you. If I tell you to start it, starting is in you. I should have enough history with you by now that you should be able to go on a come. He said, you just saw, saw what I did with the two fish and five loaves. And the text says, Peter got down out of the boat, walked on water, and came toward Jesus. Y'all better catch this. Who was in the boat? Disciples. Who's in that boat? Disciples. How many? Eleven others besides him. Watch this. So the gift Jesus gives you in this exceptional life is not distinguishing you from the world. Because it wasn't the world in that boat. Did you hear what I just said? What Jesus is trying to do is give you a light that distinguishes you from religious people who stay stuck in boats of security and mediocrity and never step into the supernatural life that's available for believers. He said, I'm not just trying to make you different from the world. I'm trying to make you different from other church people. I got to wrap up here, but somebody needs to confess this. I'm not built from the, for the boat. Uh, we got a few more days left in 2020. I came to push you out of that boat. I don't care if Thomas is in that boat. Get out. I don't care if James is in that boat. Get out. I don't care if John is in that boat. You better get out of that boat. I don't care if Nathaniel's in that boat. You better get out. I don't care if Philip is in that boat. You better get out. You're going to die in that boat. They were made for the boat, but you weren't built for the boat. You were made for the water. He gets out. And he walks on water. Peter says, I'm out of here. Uh, I'm out of here. Church like this not working for me. See, here it is. This, see, some people, some people, when you don't understand what this text is trying to teach us, you mismanage your disgruntledness, disgruntledness with the boat. And you get out of the boat, but you don't go to Jesus. I'm through with church, and then you drown. I'm done with those church, church people, then you drown. I'm out of here. He didn't just get on the water. He came toward Jesus. I'm done, brothers. I got two minutes and 28 seconds. Here it is. He gets on the water, and he comes toward Jesus. No birth, I got to go. But I got one more thing to tell you. Peter was a fisherman by trade, was he not? That's an entirely different message right there. Jesus did not pick one disciple from the temple because when you're trying to move fast, you don't have time to deprogram religious people. I'm not trying to be arguing with you about doctrine. Jesus <laughs> is sitting there arguing with you about doctrine. <clears throat> he's a fisherman by trade, is he not? So this means he's accustomed to being on the water. He's probably spent the majority of his life, he probably dealt, did some kind of apprenticeship it's probably a family business. Don't miss this, y'all. But never once is there any record of Peter asking to walk on water. Are y'all here? Until he got exposed to his leader doing it. Did you hear what I just said? 
Yes, because exposure is intended by God to awaken an appetite in you for something that's possible that you would not pursue until you got exposed to it. Now, when you don't understand how God wants to use exposure, you let the devil per pervert it and you become jealous of what you should be inspired by. New birth, you're a water walking church. And God has always given you water walking leaders. Now you got to ask yourself, why? It's because water walking is in you. And he wants to expose you to what's possible for you that you wouldn't pursue. If he didn't let you see it in somebody you love and trust. Man, Pastor, I've been arguing with people about this, especially like along racial lines and all that stuff with racial injustice and things of that nature. What makes the gospel good news is not just the historic fact, the historic facts. It's the implications of them. It, it's only good. See? The resurrection good news for Jesus, because he got up, is only good news for me if I know what that means. Does that make sense? And so as we celebrate the, advent, the coming of Jesus, it's important to understand not just that he came, but the implications of him coming. And not just the gift of his life, but the gift of life. And he wants to give you and me a life where you're the exception. Not better than, but different from. People don't do that your age. I'm the exception. People don't do that coming from the part of town you come from. I'm the exception. Because what happens with others does not dictate and determine. What can happen with me? God's speaking to you right now. Letting you know your season for being in the boat is over. Lord, thank you. So you got to be willing to be misunderstood by the 11. Because you know you're living with the approval of the one. who wants to meet you on the water. So I'm getting ready to pray right now. I'm getting ready to pray that you're going to do three things. I'm getting ready to pray that God will give you grace, enabling ability, right? Unmerited favor and enabling ability. That God will give you grace to one, embrace your uniqueness. Because if you're not willing to leave the 11, you won't be able to walk on water. Your uniqueness feels like weirdness <laughs> until you get to a season where you see why God wired you that way. And then you see what felt weird in one season is what makes you relevant for destiny. I'm praying that you'll... That you'll embrace that and not, not reject that. That emotional unhealth and low self-esteem and people pleasing won't cause you to walk in the fullness of your uniqueness. I'm praying, number, number two, that you're able to walk with the wind. Because as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to stay on top of that water. But when the wind blew, he got distracted. I'm praying in this season that you walk in the wind. What does that mean? It doesn't mean living with vision. Peter didn't have a vision problem. He took his eyes off Jesus. He had a focus problem. And all the chatter in your life is just wind blowing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And number three, I'm praying that when you feel yourself sinking, you'll scream for the Savior. Because when Peter was sinking, he said, Lord, help me. You might sink because you're imperfect. But if you know how to scream, you won't drown. 
Is there anybody watching that can say, I, I, I haven't drowned, not because I've been perfect, I hadn't drowned, because sowing and sowing and planting and not reaping. I know how to scream for the Savior who will meet me right where I am. If you're ready to receive this, I want you to, this grace, this enabling ability, I want you to put I'm ready in the chat. I'm over my time. Father, I thank you. I thank you today. I give you praise for the truth that the entrance of your word brings light. And I thank you that the light has come on for your people. On this last Sunday in Advent, I pray in the name of Jesus for grace to embrace their uniqueness. I pray that you give them strength to walk in the wind, to live a life not just with vision, but with focus, a refusal to be distracted. And I pray as they're sinking emotionally and sinking relationally, sinking professionally and sinking spiritually, that you'd give them the spiritual sensitivity to scream for the Savior. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Come on and give Jesus praise all in this place. <laughs> Come on, lift, lift your voice right in the living room, right where you are. And I want you to just worship him. Come on, just worship him, church. If you're here today, if you're here, if you're watching, wherever you're watching from, God's intentional, so this is not an accident. If you're here, you're like, Pastor Darius, I feel like I'm sinking deep in sin. I need a Savior. Like, I believe in the existence of God, but I've, I've never made a decision to make God, watch this, the forgiver of my sin and the leader of my life, my Savior and my Lord. And today, Pastor Darius, I want to make that decision. On this last Sunday of 2020 before Christmas, the last Sunday in Advent, rather, I want to give my life to Jesus. You're like, Pastor, I don't even know what that means. It's not your job to understand. It's our job to teach you. So right on the screen is coming instruction for your next step. That's your faith step, all right? This is you getting out of the boat, and you following the instruction on that screen to say, from this day forward, I'm receiving Jesus as a forgiver of my sin, behavior that I've engaged in that's, that's hurt me and hurt others, and the leader of my life, my Lord and my Savior. You, you, you follow that instruction on this screen, and God's going to change your life. Now, I'm getting ready to go, but before I do, I also want to ask you this. I want to ask you, has God, listen to me, kept you from sinking in 2020? Uh, if 2020 has revealed anything, it is revealed that everything you thought was a source was a resource. God is your source. So here's the question. If you recognize that, what's your response to that recognition? How do you demonstrate to God? I want to thank you. I want to thank you for, for Jesus. Christmas is Jesus' birthday. I want to give to you on this day. Like, like the wise men, they brought gifts to Jesus. Look, I just want to give to you. I want to, in this season where it's tight and tough, I want to demonstrate my love to you by saying, I'm going to give something extra. 
I'm going to give as I've been prospered. And so as you're stirred and as you're led, we want to encourage you to do that today. To give just, watch this, just a love offering to God. Saying thank you for not letting me sink in 2020. The instruction is coming on the screen to say thank you God for keeping me afloat. Blessings on you. I pray that 2021 is the best year of your life. I love you. of God, by the love of God, by the mercy of God. When I was a little kid, the first song I learned in the gospel choir was all day, all night, the angels are watching over me, my Lord. I declare that over you, that he's got you covered. You can't sink. I know this holiday feels a little bit strange. You can't move like you used to, can't travel like you used to, but you got good news. God's got you covered. And he won't let you say. I'm grateful that uh, Pastor Darius has come our way. He preached, I'm out of here. But if you want Pastor Darius to come back, I need you to type right now, come back here. He said he's out of here, but we need him to come back here and come back uh, real soon. On Christmas morning, we're going to worship again. Our fine arts ministry is going to uh, really bring Broadway to new birth. It's going to be amazing. The gospel is going to go forth, and I'm telling you, lives are going to be impacted and changed. You don't have to look for nothing under the tree when you remember what Jesus did on the tree. I demand you not to be depressed, for you not to have anxiety attacks, for you not to be swallowed in stress but that God would give you a peace that passes all understanding. If nobody else tells you this week, I want you to know your pastor loves you. I'm praying for you, and I'm believing that the rest of your life is going to be the best of your life. Get excited. We out of here. You are not built for the boat, but you're about to walk on water. Stay tuned. Hey. We